Hello? Ah, we're working. Good afternoon, everybody. Should we get started? I know we're slightly comatose after lunch, at least I am, but I've got a scintillating topic for you this afternoon that I'm sure we're all going to be excited about. My name is uh, Matt Reisinger. I'm a uh, builder here in Austin, and uh, it's a privilege to talk to such a distinguished crowd. This is a great example of South Texas architecture that uh, we're not doing enough here in Austin. You know, when we have a roof bleak in South Texas, all we do is put another metal roof on and you're good to go. It doesn't do a whole lot for insulation, but man, that makes for a durable structure right there. Here's another great example of, uh, of uh, very high performance duct work. Uh, and of course, Another great redneck architecture example here, a good remodel on a 50, beautiful 40s or 50s house. So let's talk quickly about what our goals are for today. We're gonna talk specifically about roofing and insulation. And most of the time when we talk about that to the general public, people think about roofing as the pitched part and they think about the insulation as what's right above the ceiling on the second floor. So we're gonna challenge that a little bit. and. However, we do want to remember that, uh, that as we talk about goals, there's lots of failures that have happened with those goals, and, and I'm going to confess a few of those failures to you today. Um, so let's talk about some systems. Uh, traditionally here in Texas, we've done a lot of ranch style houses. This is actually my house I bought 10 years ago with, uh, uh, with a hip roof, two foot overhangs. Well, that roof's working great in terms of uh, keeping my house dry. Not particularly great for energy efficiency. This is what it looked like when I bought it. Um, some 1970s ducks up there in the hot attic. And if you think about it, that's really not that far different than the redneck uh, ducting that I, shot, that I showed you a few minutes ago. We're still outside, we're still out in the hot, humid attic. In fact, we're probably hotter in my attic up there than we are actually if we put them outside. My attic easily gets in the 130s, 140s. Plus, when we bring those ducks to the outside, don't forget when those ducks leak, we're leaking to the outside. And so it's kind of like if we'd open a window and put a fan in that window, so we're depressurizing our houses. So not only are we paying to air condition those attics, but we're depressurizing pressurizing our houses by putting those up there. And it's really hard to inspect and get a good insulation job when that attic's up there and there's so many places that the insulator can mess. So let's fast forward another 30 years or so. This is a house that we remodeled uh, that was built around the year 2000, uh, the, the typical Tuscan, Tuscan explosion house. Tile roof, tile's a great uh, durable product for, uh, for this climate zone. And this is what their attic looked like. Interestingly enough, looked just like a 70s attic, not too much different. And here's a photo I took two weeks ago of a house under construction in Terrytown. What's happened? I was born in 72, my house is about the same age, so 42 years later, the attic and the roof system's pretty much the same. We need to make a change here. I think, I think something needs to happen. So here's what I would purport as five or 10 years ago as my best practice roof and attic system. Uh, this, this is a great house. This is a house we built with uh, Barley and Pfeiffer Architects. Metal roof, great overhangs. Metal is obviously a very durable uh, product. And, uh, and that's a house that we've done this system on many, many times in the, in the past. We've got great spray foam up on the roof line. We, we put uh, uh, you know, code depth insulation on spray foam up there. You can still see the rafters. Uh, and here we buried them a little better, but for the most part our ducts are now inside the conditioned space. We've, we've gone from redneck ducting to a real truly high performance duct system. So now if we leak a little air conditioning, we've leaked it into the condition envelope and we didn't cause a, uh, a depressurization on our houses. This is it's quite a bit better. This is, this is what I would consider a really good practice. However, what happens on, those, on the days uh, where we've got some thermal bridging happening. Here's, here's a wintertime shot of a house with that same system that we built. A beautiful house. We, we, uh, uh, we worked with Nick Deaver on this one. And uh, here's what you see in the wintertime when it's cold. Of course, it's not cold here often, but uh, if you can tell from the photos, you can see the outline of every one of those little rafters up there because those rafters are, are a huge thermal bridge. So one of the first things I, wanna, I want to, uh, to talk about today is how do we get our roof lines more um, efficient than just spray foaming? Spray foaming has been great. That's been a good system for many years for us. But how do we go beyond that? How do we get really to the next level of efficiency? 
Here's a house that we built in, uh, in 08 with Hugh Jefferson Randolph Architects. And um, this one has a paint grip metal roof and a metal, obviously another great material. And this is basically the system we used. We used uh, a couple inches of rigid foam on top of the roof deck and then covered that rigid foam with this same, that's not the house, but this is the same system where it's been covered with a, a fully adhered uh, water and ice protection. This is actually Carlisle's WIP 300 HT, where the HT stands for high temperature. And this roofing membrane, this is a you know a peel and stick, is rated for like 210 degrees. So just shy of boiling water, should be just fine according to the manufacturer. Here's the hot roof that went on top of that, and that thing will fry an egg in a second in weather like this. And uh, here's my roofer and I coming out to take care of a roof leak on this house. And lo and behold, here's what that thing looks like about 18 months later. Absolutely fried. And this is a roof membrane that's supposed to be good for 200 degrees. Man, it looked like it was 50 years old. That 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 uh, flexible membrane that you buy that's all nice and goopy, it was so stiff and brittle, it would peel off in, in strips after 18 months. So that's really two summers worth. Um, the leak wasn't necessarily related to this. It was another problem that we messed up on. But I thought it was incredibly interesting that uh, we neglected to vent this roof underneath. And here's, what, here's where the problem was, just a very short time later, that I don't think that, that membrane was doing anything in terms of uh, actually self-healing or preventing a leak or any water that got past the metal from getting down below. So here's, here's a better way to do it. We've talked about this for years, is venting our metal roofs. Basically, this is taking the rain screen or the gap principle and putting that on your roof. Now, this, this is gonna make a huge difference now, because think about this, if my roof leaks and I've got a one by four or a three quarter inch airspace in there, now that water or condensation or whatever it's happening that gets beyond that skin, that metal, it's got an airspace. It's got a place where it can dry, that it can drain. There's going to be quite a bit of airflow in there as long as we vent that at the uh, eaves and, and the ridge line. And then we can screw our metal right onto the, uh, the lath. This is a much better roof system. If you were in my earlier presentation uh, today, I'm, I'm sorry to, uh, to double up on slides, but I thought this was such a good one that, that we needed to uh, talk about it again. As I've been in the business for about 20 years now, we've done uh, a lot of remodeling in houses in Austin from about the 30s on. We haven't built too many houses prior to the, prior to the 20s or 30s in Austin. Almost every house has some problem that we find in it. Interestingly enough, as the, as the overhangs go up though, we sure have a lot less problems with those houses. Another great slide from uh, Building Science Corporation. This one takes a little while to, uh, to read. And again, I apologize if you've seen this for the second time. But the big takeaway on this, I think, is that if you, if you think about rain happening, we always think that if we've got some overhang, like a flat roof overhang here, that we're going to protect our walls below. And what this, what this projection or what this slide is showing is this far left here is just a light rain, a half millimeter droplet, just a tiny little droplet. Not a lot of, not a lot of uh, velocity happening, not a lot of uh, wind pressure. Then as the droplet goes up, we get a one millimeter and a big deluge here, a three millimeter. Look at what's happening with that flat roof. All those walls are getting wet in all three cases, even with an overhang on a flat roof. If we pitch that roof, we're able to, to uh, give that wall quite a bit more protection, even with the same amount of overhang. Look at, in the light rain, that wall doesn't get wet. In a medium rain, that wall doesn't get wet. The only time that wall gets wet is if we have a lot of wind with heavy rain. That's the only time that wall is really getting wet. And that plays out in my experience too when I, when I think about houses that we've worked on. This was a 60s house we remodeled with uh, Weber Studios. Had huge four and five foot overhangs over the whole house with a brick facade. And when we pulled that house apart, we really didn't find any problems with that house. It was unbelievable. It was one of the few houses that I pulled apart that really didn't have any issues. I think a lot of that was due to those four and five foot overhangs. But one of the neat things uh, about remodeling, or one of the fun things I like about remodeling in particular, is we get, to, we get to learn some lessons and then take our building science background and apply that to architecture. So when we poked our head up in the attic when we were looking to remodel this, this was the picture we saw. Pretty, pretty standard looking uh, roof insula or, uh, pardon me, ceiling insulation, standard ductwork. But wow, look at that structure on the house. This was a little different. It had, it had massive beams and uh, huge four by sixes that were tongue and groove that was supporting the roof. 
So we said, what if we take that same roof design where all that insulation now goes on top of the roof, now all of a sudden we can expose the roof on the inside of the house. And then we were able to bring the ductwork to the inside in a pretty interesting fashion as well. There's, uh, there's David Weber. And he, he made this really interesting uh, design where he basically brought the ductwork into kind of a mechanical zone uh, at the roof line or at the ceiling line that kind of ran through the middle corridor of the house. And now all that roof got exposed and we ended up painting it later with a really interesting clear story window uh, through the middle corridor of the house. I think I've got a finished picture here too, which didn't show up very well. So let's go back to standard construction practices one more time. Here's a, here's a great house, has good overhangs. This is one under construction that we're building in, uh, in Terrytown. But the problem that we found with this type of uh, standard construction or, or standard overhangs, overhangs are great, don't get me wrong, but is if we're gonna condition that attic and these rafter tails are gonna poke through, gosh, we've got a lot of penetrations. We've got miles of cracks we need to deal with. So I, I tried to get a picture in the darkness to kind of show you the, uh, the issue we're dealing with. There's, there's miles of these cracks that we're trying to seal up and here's the outside. We have the same issue with the Tyvek when we, uh, when we run whatever our, our uh, weather barrier is on the outside. And so the way that we've done it traditionally over the past is we've gone in there with, uh, with one of our carpenters and given him a couple cans of spray foam and said, okay, you got six miles of cracks and you got a day and a half. Let's get them all taken care of. And so he did a great job, I felt like, you know, <laughs> sealing all those cracks up. And then on the outside, we're, we're doing the same thing with the, uh, with the insulation. On this house, we've got a one inch continuous insulation on the, on the outside. But man, that is really hard to deal with those overhangs and take care of all those, those uh, kind of details that are necessary to do a good job. So what I want to talk to you about now is uh, a concept we, we uh, have, if you've heard me speak before, we've, we've uh, talked about a lot. This is Joe LeSebrook's perfect wall. The concept is, if we could build a wall that would last 500 years, what would that wall look like? It's not very often that we actually hear someone talk about 500 year or even 100 year durability in a structure. So to have, have this guy, Joe Lestebrick, who's a really well-known building scientist in America say, this is a wall section that will last 500 years, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. I'm working with uh, Eric Rouser, who's in the front here uh, on a project. Eric uh, is my business partner, and he's, a, he's the architect on a, on a project where we were able to utilize this perfect wall. And here's the, here's the cross section. Let me give you the background here. You've got standard stud frame construction, pretty normal looking residential back there. So there's your two by fours. And then we sheathe the house in a slightly pretty way where we use some one buys. Uh, so that on the inside of the house we'd have something interesting going on. Then we put our standard OSB shear wall on. And then outboard of that, we're putting on a, uh, a full ice and water shield peel and stick type membrane. And then all the insulation is going on board or on top of that membrane. So ultimately that membrane is going to live at the same temperature and humidity as the rest of the occupants of the house will. And then remember we talked about that venting. That's super important. We want to put a vent space behind our cladding. And if you take the perfect wall and you tilt it, we've got the perfect roof. It's pretty simple. The big key on this though, is we need everything to be continuous. When, where we take that peel and stick membrane, it needs to go straight up the wall and then turn right into the roof. Same with that insulation, it needs to go right up the wall and turn right into the roof. And then ultimately our cladding is really just a UV barrier. <coughs> our cladding is just making sure that, that that insulation is taken care of and doesn't get any UV and rain can get through there no problem. So here's the house that we, that we uh, have going on in East Austin right now. That's the first one we've done with this concept. You can see it's, it's framed pretty conventionally. And now we're showing the, uh, a little hard to see here, but we've got that, that full ice and water shield on the roof and it wraps right around onto the face of the walls. We've got no overhangs at this, at this point in the house. There's Christoph Irwin relaying a little uh, primer for me. I recruited him that day. So full peel and stick exterior. Uh, really good job with uh, window install with really well done sill pans uh, from the same manufacturer here. This is Carlisle's product. And there's the completed house ready for the insulation. The insulation is staged. 
Here's, here's the slide I really wanted to show though. All the, uh, all the brackets that we'd use to hang the, uh, the awnings were kind of bolted on after the fact. So now my insulation, when we put that insulation on, can run right behind that bracket. It's going to be totally continuous except for those small little pieces of sheer tab right there that are going to get welded onto later. Here's the inside of the house at the framing stage. And remember, all the insulation is outboard on this house. And so as a result, we were able to basically not put any cavity insulation. And once we didn't have cavity insulation, why do we need sheetrock in this case? So Eric said, hey, why don't, we, uh, why don't we actually paint the studs with a kind of a light paint? And let's call that good. I'll show you some pictures of that in just a minute. But here's a detail on the outside. When we get, when we get the foam here on top of the, uh, the weather barrier, or this peel and stick in this case, think about the life of that peel and stick. If, you, if, if we think about that peel and stick from prior photos that was just melted and charred and looking nasty, it was right up against that metal. It was exposed to the elements. It was 200 plus degrees, obviously, because it was rated for 200 and it still melted. This peel and stick on the other hand here is gonna have a layer of OSB behind it, and then behind that, nothing. So it's really gonna live probably within, I would bet 10 degrees or so, plus or minus of whatever's happening inside of the house. So if the house lives at 65 to 85 degrees, I think that peeling stick's gonna have a real good chance of lasting a long, long time in those conditions. And then here's the, uh, the one by four batten we're using on the outside to form that rain screen, that, that air gap behind that siding to make sure that no pressure is gonna force any water into our cavity. A little tough to see, but we're, we're showing the uh, protection at the bottom of the foam to make sure that bugs aren't getting up and eating into our foam someday. And then we've got a, uh, a, a, a kind of a cheap version of core vent going on here. This is actually core plast we bought from Regal Plastics and ripped down into whatever size we want. It makes a great detail for, uh, for both rain screen or bottom venting. It's about half the price of the uh, commercial product. And then here's your two layers going up. The carpenters are laying up the foam and the furring at the same time there. And here's the roof, since we're talking about roofing, and this is really a, a roof-related uh, talk today. We've got two, six, or two three-inch layers to give us six inches total. You can see all the seams are staggered, so there's those two joints on that, and that next piece right there is running up the other direction, so we've got staggered seams on there. And then we've got, again, the one by four. It's a little tough to sell, but there's a one by four on top of that. And then here we're ready for our cladding at this point, just about. And then here's that bolt-on. Remember we, we showed that slide earlier of the, uh, of the rafter tails sticking out of that house, and I had to get my carpenter to spray foam and take care of those miles of cracks to make that condition attic? Think about the difference on this house where my carpenter basically peeled and sticked all the way up around in a big U-shape. Uh, basically saran wrap the house and then all these awnings and overhangs are basically bolted on and the only thing that I'm worried about waterproofing or air sealing is just that little sheer tab right there. That's a really easy connection to, uh, to waterproof or air seal. It's a, it's a neat system. The more, the more I've thought about it, the more I've learned about this perfect wall and perfect roof, the more intriguing it is. So uh, here's the corrugated steel uh, siding going up on the walls. And then we've got uh, basically the same thing going on the, uh, on the roof here. I think this is uh, our panel on the roofs. And then here's the finished, here's the finished uh, detail. So all they're doing is putting a flashing on so that water running down the, uh, the face of the siding here is gonna hit that flashing and come right down here on that overhang. But ultimately that air gap that's back there is running fully continuous from the top to the bottom right behind that awning. And, uh, and then we did wanna do some amount of guttering to make sure that water wasn't washing down. So we did kind of a, a thick six inch box beam gutter that Eric specified on the, uh, on the two sides there to try and capture some of that rain coming off of there. There's a better photo of it. And then here's the inside. This is one of the most interesting things, I think, from, a, from an architecture perspective. Once all those control layers are on the outside and we don't really need that inside insulation, boy, it brings up a world of possibilities for the inside of the house. And, uh, and this was a really fun one to build. I've never, never built a house before where all the framing was exposed. It was, it was a whole uh, mindset shift 
for my frame carpenter and I to say, okay, if we're gonna look at this later and people are gonna see the way we frame this, nothing's getting covered, how do we do that in a way that uh, is pretty but is not so over the top that it's gonna triple the budget? And we spent a fair amount of time talking through those details and really getting those right. Even things like, uh, you know, we use traditional uh, two by 10, I believe, floor joists on there. And then we wanted to, to do fairly traditional blocking. So that's that one by X bracing that you'd see in uh, 40s and 50s houses. And then the, the uh, flooring up here is uh, often referred to as car deck. It's a two by six uh, tongue and groove product you can buy right off the shelf. And now the ceiling is the car deck that's been painted. And then the floor above is just sanded uh, down pine car deck. So you can see that, that that is the finished floor in the house. The other beauty of this house is uh, now that we've really taken care of that air infiltration, this, this house should, should uh, blow door test very close to passive house <coughs> standards. Now all we need is just a, a real simple mechanical system. We've got a three head mini split system. The house is 1700-ish is, uh, square feet or so. And so we've got three heads in the house. And then we've got a little air share fan that's moving some air from the, from the very highest peak back downstairs. And that's, that's it, it's a really simple system. And again, there's, your, there's the back side of the perfect roof, which I love up there, just seeing the back of those rafters. And, and there's the, uh, uh, the roof decking right there. So here's the uh, nearly completed house. We've got just a little bit more to go, about 30 days or so till we finish up. If, if you got a chance to come out on the Korean tour, we had this uh, on the Korean tour about, I don't know, three or four months ago. That is it, I'm done. The perfect roof, the perfect wall.